At the time, and seeing that we are here, I would like to begin the session by welcoming you all for uh, to this special live cast edition of ID for Africa, uh, where we are focusing on a very important subject, which is the question of the unique identity numbers. And you might say, well, unique identity numbers have been around. Um, uh, what is so new about them? Yes, they have been around. They have been attributed by identity authorities. Um, they have been um, uh, associated with national ID or, or other sectorial um, identity numbers. Um, and and the, the, the thing that has changed right now is the fact that COVID has made digital identity a much higher priority and a much needed necessity. And as a consequence, when we speak digital identity, we speak about a digital identifier. You may have noticed that I began to slow down. And the reason I am doing this is because we do have two channels of translation going on. And the translators are trying to translate what I'm saying to French. And then of course, there's another channel. If somebody speaks in French, they will try to translate to English. This is our first experience with simultaneous translation using Zoom. So I, I, I ask the panelists to attempt to slow down like I'm trying to do right now. Anyway, so with COVID requiring digital identity and digital ID numbers, there is a, a rush to establish those numbers. And there is not a single way to, to do that. There are people who say it should be one unique and universal number attributed to everybody and therefore used by all service delivery mechanisms. There are others who believe why should one sector know about what's happening in another sector and invade the privacy of people. There should be perhaps a collection of numbers attributed to a unique identity and linked in the back end, not in a visible way, but in a way that protects the privacy of the person and maintains that under control. So there are pluses and minuses. ID for Africa does not take any position regarding which is the right solution. ID for Africa would like to stimulate the discussion so that you as the attendees and representatives of, of the different agencies that are trying to implement these unique ID numbers will have a choice to make. So today I am very excited to have with me an illustrious panel of experts who will share with us uh, their perspectives on this particular issue. And the structure of the program is as follows. We will start with a keynote presentation from Jonathan Marskill from the World Bank. After the keynote presentation, we will be able to uh, hear the perspective of the different countries who are joined the panel to explain to us what their countries have done with the unique ID numbers and what was the rationale and the motivation for structuring the number in the way they've done. Uh, today, we also are going to be privileging a new concept, which is called community voices, which means if you are an expert and you have something to add, perhaps you can uh, raise your hand and, and, and a moderator from ID for Africa will connect with you and will bring you to my attention and perhaps we can bring you on to say a comment and react to the panelists. We will do that after the panelists have finished their prepared remarks. Um, so I think uh, without any further delay, I would like to invite Jonathan um, to take the stage and share his screen and give uh, the PowerPoint presentation, the keynote presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Joseph. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or uh, good evening from Australia, where I am. I'm not actually in Washington, D.C. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and um, it's great that ID for Africa has organized this uh, very important uh, discussion. Um, and hopefully it's a discussion that will continue um, uh, in, in the weeks and months ahead. And likewise, it's, it's great to be with such an illustrious panel of, of ID practitioners and, and data protection uh, officers. My presentation intends to um, uh, frame the discussion. Um, the World Bank's ID for D program, for which I work for, has been studying uh, the issue of the benefits and the risks of unique ID numbers um, for quite a while now. Um, and, and a lot of issues have come up uh, within that context, including opportunities um, to protect um, uh, uh, people and their identity um, through additional measures such as tokenization. Um, and we're hearing more and more about sectoral IDs, sectoral ID numbers. Um, the work that I'm about to present or the analysis that I'm about to present builds on some previous work that we've done through our ID for D practitioners guide, which has been downloaded, I think, 8,000 times now, and the privacy by design paper that we've published, which highlights best practices from Austria, Estonia and India. And part of that does include indeed tokenization. We're now going through, um, we're continuing our discovery and we're working with a number of countries, um, including, for example, the Philippines, Tunisia. Um, we look forward to supporting Nigeria as well, which we're gonna hear more about from uh, Ms. Hadiza. Um, and so we look forward to, to partnerships with more countries uh, on this issue. So to begin with, the, the benefits of unique ID numbers, uh, this shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. The purpose um, is to serve as a reference uh, within a system so that the same person does not have to re-register every time and that person can continuously be identified uniquely for that um, uh, within that system. And in the case of the financial sector, this is very important for the integrity of the financial system, that it's the same person that, that, that's continuing to come back and back to access services. And therefore, it's um, very powerful for, for facilitating financial inclusion. Then when the same number is used across different systems, that allows um, uh, a data on the same person to be, uh, to be matched. Um, so we're seeing this a lot within the context of COVID-19 where countries have had to deploy their social assistance very quickly. And as part of that, they've had to check the eligibility of someone. Are they registered in a social security program? Are they, do they own land? Are they already receiving benefits um, from the farmer subsidy program, for example? Now, the use of a unique number in some of these contexts has shown to, to help uh, streamline that process and to automate it to a great extent. Now, because of their universality, unique ID numbers issued by foundational ID systems, like a civil registry or a national ID, and let's call it a national ID number or NIN, allows these benefits to be realized across many services and programs and potentially all of them. So this is extremely important for um, the administration of a country, the, the delivery of services, and in many respects, allowing people to um, exercise their rights and, and access their entitlements. However, there are risks of a pervasive or a ubiquitous uh, unique ID number that is exposed and used. So first of all, in terms of privacy, um, it allows the unlawful or unauthorized or unwarranted correlation of data across systems. And um, this can uh, lead to surveillance um, and it can lead to far worse consequences because the, um, uh, the use of a unique ID number across systems also allows that to be used for good and for bad purposes. Then in terms of security, if, the, if a unique ID number is used for many purposes and it's used as part of verifying identity, then if it's ever exposed or breached or, or lost control of, then that person's identity can be assumed, right? Even if there is a strong authenticator, such as biometrics, there is still a risk. Um, relying parties who use ID systems, so for example, banks or credit card companies or government agencies, they still often just use a unique number. And therefore, it, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily completely safeguard against such risks. Now, these risks become uh, 
greater when a, when the ID number is permanent as what a national ID number usually is, and when it has more uses as what a national ID number normally does. And these risks are present across four um, areas, at least four areas. One is when they're printed on an ID card. In many countries, um, it's commonplace to hand in your ID card when you, um, uh, when you enter a building, right? Um, and, and that ID card can be photocopied, scanned, et cetera. And so then you lose control of it forever. Also, when you're filling out forms or in the middle of transactions, when data is going, for example, from a point of authentication to the, the system that authenticates somebody, it can be intercepted. And finally, and, 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 and what we've seen a lot of is when the ID number is seeded into many databases. Now on that issue, um, often when, an, when an, an ID numbers are seeded and there is a breach, it's actually often not a breach of the ID system itself. In fact, in many cases, it's beyond the control of the ID system, but the public perception may be different. The public will say the national ID numbers were breached, so the national ID system was breached. And so this is not just an ID issue. In fact, in many countries, you've got four examples here. In South Africa, 60 million national ID numbers were leaked from a real estate database. In South Korea, a credit card database leaked many million. In the US, the famous Equifax breach, it's a, a credit bureau. That they, it wasn't a breach of the social security card system, it was a breach of Equifax. And then in India, there's been many uh, allegations of the, the Aadhaar being hacked, but in most cases, it's actually that, um, that the relying parties who store that number are, being, uh, are the ones that have been breached. So once an, once an ID number is generated or once an ID card is personalized, the ID system often loses control over it. So it's very crucial that ID agencies and, and the governments as a whole, including the data protection authorities um, and other regulators, think of this in a holistic manner. So Jonathan, how can these... Slow, yeah. Jonathan, slow down the speech. Uh, sorry, slow down. Slow down the speech. Okay, okay. So how, how can the risks be mitigated? So there's two activities that are absolutely required. First of all, is having legal and institutional safeguards that govern and enforce how um, and why and when national ID numbers or other unique ID numbers are used. Uh, some countries don't allow the private sector to use it. For example, the Netherlands. Some countries have very strict restrictions even on what government agencies can use national ID numbers, such as Singapore. And even New Zealand has completely banned uh, unique ID numbers that are used for multiple purposes. But then there's other, you know, there's other degrees of how this is governed. But what's very important is that there is accountability and oversight over this uh, and rules about what happens uh, when something goes wrong. Then there is strong information and cybersecurity. Um, that involves protecting the systems, the networks, um, things like masking, encryption, um, uh, identity and access management, uh, etc., uh, for the systems and networks that actually use and consume the national ID numbers and other UINs. But it's very important to note that no uh, security measures are going to be perfect. There's always going to be uh, uh, risks and vulnerabilities in the system, and there's always going to be bad actors who with enough resources can do bad things. Now, some other strategies that countries are adopting, um, here's three examples. This is not exhaustive, but um, the first one is tokenization, which I'm gonna talk about um, in, in a little while. Um, tokenization, as it, as it says there, is about um, not uh, preventing the use of the national ID number, but hiding it or protecting it because it's a sensitive piece of personal information. So it can be hidden through various means um, while it's being used or stored in the ways, in the four ways that I mentioned earlier. Then there's sectoral uh, ID numbers. So uh, countries may define sectors like the health sector or the social sector, the financial sector, who would share a unique ID number. And ideally that those would be um, rooted on a, a, a national identity. Then there is another layer, which is the authentication layer and, and federation or decentralization of the credentials that facilitate uh, that, um, that authentication. So this distribution of the, the functioning of the of an ID system 
um, reduces the, um, or it, it distributes the transactional data, um, uh, so, so, that, so it mitigates the risk or distributes the risk. Coming back to tokenization, um, it, it, I want to talk in a bit more detail about this because perhaps of, of all the strategies, it's the, less, uh, the least intuitive. Um, bear with me, it's, it's a complex uh, um, uh, topic and it's not easy to explain this on a single slide. Now, what it is, is substituting a sensitive piece of data or an attribute such as a national ID number with a non-sensitive equivalent. And that non-sensitive equivalent actually has no value by itself, but it can be linked back to the sensitive information through what's called a tokenization system. So the tokenization system may do this, the linking between a token and its root uh, with cryptography or an algorithm or a mapper. Um, the um, Austria uses cryptography. Um, India through Adha uses um, uh, an algorithm and perhaps other countries could use a mapper, which, which is um, uh, not a sophisticated uh, technology, but, but, but perhaps uh, easier to deploy. Now, what's very important is that a tokenization system or a good one can facilitate the matching across systems that I mentioned earlier, which is a key benefit of unique ID numbers. Um, and, and what can also happen as part of that tokenization system is that it can govern the rules uh, that allow um, uh, various parties to match that data. So for example, it might require the consent of the individual or, or and as well as a late legal basis. Now, what's also important about tokenization is, although it may be a new topic for the um, identity uh, uh, sphere, it's actually been used for decades in the payments and credit cards industries. So the, the, the technology itself is mature, but maybe not so much within the context of ID systems, but nonetheless, generally it's mature. As I mentioned earlier, several countries are already using it. I referred to Austria, who have um, a very uh, unique and sophisticated system with private keys stored on, on the smart card chip. You have France, who uses it as part of France Connect. And then you have India, which I mentioned earlier, as part of Adha. And, I, and Nigeria, we're very excited, is going to be um, uh, uh, deploying it. And, and we look forward to supporting them uh, as part of that journey through, through our uh, ID for D project there. And, and it's, it's good to note that uh, tokenization is, is part of the modular open source identity platform, or MOSIP, um, uh, which is an open source, freely available ident core identity software um, that any country can use. Even if you don't actually uh, adopt it, you can uh, look at the code, scrutinize the code, and, and study the design for, for how each country may want to implement it. So there's two kinds of tokenization, as you can see here on the right. Um, that are facilitated through that tokenization system. First is front-end tokenization. And this, this is when a, a, a person, the ID holder, generates the, the token for themselves. This may be for a particular time period, like six months or one month or a day, or for a particular transaction. And it would be used in the same way as a national ID number. And the example is the Adha virtual ID in India. Then there's another, you know, more simpler uh, version of that, which is, um, I mentioned the, the permanent ID number being printed on the card, but what, what if you printed a token that was only valid for the value of, for the life of the card? So for example, in the Philippines, they're not printing the Philsys number on the ID cards. They're printing a temporary Philsys card number. That will be a new one will be generated each time a person gets a new card. Now, what's also important about front-end tokenization is that this requires acceptance by, by people, by the public, the citizens and the residents, and also the relying parties. So it can be complex to implement. Then there's back-end tokenization. And what happens here is for, for seeding, after a successful authentication, uh, the tokenization system would generate a token that would allow the relying party to store. Now, in the case, I mentioned Austria earlier, it's called the SS pin. And this requires only uh, acceptance by the relying parties. So the citizens or the people don't have to do anything. So it's probably easier to, from one perspective to deploy because you don't have to educate, you know, perhaps millions and tens of millions of people. But relying parties need to be able to uh, adopt that system. Um, so for example, in, in with Adhar, I think it's a 56 alphanumeric uh, token that is generated. 
So uh, a, a, a state government, a, a social protection agency needs to know that they're not going to get the 12 digit Adha number, they're going to get a 56 digit alphanumeric uh, um, a string. So I'm going to conclude. My, yep. Yep. I'm going to conclude my presentation just with these key messages. So the first one is that um, the, the UINs must be protected to mitigate those privacy and security risks that I mentioned, but also they must be protected in such a way that doesn't prevent the lawful uh, matching uh, and, and unique identification that I mentioned earlier. And this is not an ID issue. It's actually a whole of country issue um, and a whole of society issue. So it needs to be looked at through a comprehensive holistic uh, lens. Strong legal and institutional safeguards and, and cyber security, information security uh, postures are essential. And the benefits that, that I've described can be uh, realized through some of these strategies that I mentioned, such as tokenization, sectoral uh, unique ID numbers, and uh, alternative such uh, authentication methods such as decentralized or federated models. And importantly, these are becoming more accessible and more realistic. But, but, the big but, the right mitigation strategy for each country will depend on the local context. And that includes the maturity of the ID system, the maturity of the legal framework, and the willingness of relying parties, the ID agency, to, um, to, to implement such measures. Thank you very much. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you very much for um, a wonderful presentation that really highlights the richness of this subject and the challenges that we as the identity community working together would need to overcome to produce uh, the right identifiers that respect privacy but enable still the, the linkage with services across government sectors. Um, before we continue, um, we're going to go into debate sessions, but I want to do a quick poll. So ID for Africa moderator, could you please run the poll? and? Uh, Please, attendees, uh, respond to the poll. Um, it basically says, just a very simple poll. What do you think? The identity unique ID number uh, should, should be the same number used across all sectors, or should it be different for each sector? Devrait être le même numéro utilisé à travers tous les secteurs, ou devrait être différent pour chaque secteur? So just a, just a simple uh, attitude reality check um, that we want to start with. So um, we'll see 42% um, have voted. We'll give you more chance to, to vote. So please give us your opinion. We wanna hear about that. Um, clearly, um, this is not a scientific poll, but at least it gives uh, an indication for where the attendees and the community uh, mind is. <clears throat> the second segment of this uh, session for today we are going to go um, country by country and ask the panelists to give us uh, their perspective about the subject. Uh, what do they think um, if their country has a unique ID uh, project, uh, identity project in place? What is the structure of that unique ID? And how are they protecting or not protecting uh, if, if the issue of privacy maybe is not a serious issue in their country? Um, so I'd like to... Um, in fact, we have 64% of the vote. I think I will stop the, the, the voting here. As you can see, 66% uh, have said unique, universal, and 35% believe it should be different for each sector. So we are talking about two thirds, one way, and one third, the other. Um, okay, so let's keep this as a data point as we continue the dialogue. My next guest, Jonathan, thank you, but I'd like you to stay because there will be questions that you may want to help us with and participate with your expertise. Thank you so much. Uh, my next guest, my next guest um, is Omar Shagrushni. Um, I will address Omar uh, in, in French. Um, Omar, le Maroc aujourd'hui est en train de mettre en place en œuvre uh, plusieurs projets um, pour l'identité numérique et Dans chaque projet, il y a un composant, il y a un élément euh, qui a l'identité, qui a un numéro identifiant unique de certaines façons. Euh, récemment, l'organisation où vous êtes à la tête de cette organisation, la CNDP, a, a tiré la sonnette de l'alarme à propos de le, le numéro identifiant unique. Alors, est-ce que vous pouvez 
expliquer quels sont les soucis que vous avez et aussi comment vous voyez la démarche pour identifier la population uniquement. Euh, Merci beaucoup encore une fois pour euh, nous donner cette opportunité d'échanger, d'échanger avec euh, d'autres experts et d'échanger avec nos différents collègues sur euh, le sujet. J'ai essayé de voter en tant que conférencier euh, au niveau du sondage, mais je n'ai pas réussi. Non, les conférenciers n'ont pas le droit. Mais, mais peut-être que si les conférenciers avaient voté, ça aurait changé un peu le résultat. Mais je plaisante. <rire> Alors... Euh, oui, en fait, cette problématique d'identifiant est, est pour nous euh, assez, euh, assez complexe. Et euh, le problème pour nous est que souvent, elle est vue comme euh, uniquement euh, avec sa dimension technique de réalisation et réalis réalisabilité, mais pas forcément euh, au niveau de tout le reste, euh, au niveau des, des impacts euh, qui peut y avoir par ailleurs. Deuxième point que j'aimerais euh, étayer, euh, c'est que la protection des données à caractère personnel et de la vie privée et donc le choix de l'architecture des identifiants à retenir dépend aussi de la maturité de plein de choses. Maturité de l'écosystème, maturité de la société, euh, maturité de différents éléments qui viennent contribuer au fait que la solution choisie est efficace ou pas. Et donc, nous, on préfère parler d'architecture des identifiants pour sortir du débat identifiant unique versus identifiant sectoriel ou identifiant unique global et identifiant unique au pluriel, c'est-à-dire un identifiant pour chaque secteur ou chaque sous-secteur. Donc on préfère parler d'architecture des identifiants. Cette architecture des identifiants, pour nous, doit assurer un ensemble de protections. Et la première des protections, c'est faire en sorte que lorsqu'on est amené à faire des interconnexions, que ces interconnexions soient sous le couvert de loi pour des finalités particulières et ne soient pas dans une logique permanente ou de possibilités permanentes d'interconnexion. On pense, on n'a peut-être pas raison, mais on pense que avant d'arriver à une interconnexion permanente, euh, cela nécessite un échange, un débat et une prise de conscience des conséquences possibles. Et qu'on ne peut pas faire passer une logique euh, d'identifiant unique euh, uniquement par un souci technique parce qu'on sait qu'on a parce qu'on raisonne comme dans une entreprise une entreprise a besoin de connaître ses clients une entreprise a besoin du, de faire du customer relationship management et donc on veut étendre ce raisonnement qui est euh, très bien par rapport à une entreprise à un état et on pense que ça mérite réflexion et que ce ce, ce, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui se décide de façon immédiate en dernier lieu, ce que, ce que je, je, je dirais, c'est que souvent la, la protection, euh, elle n'est pas souvent les gens, lorsqu'ils parlent de protection des données, etc., ils pensent à l'État, ils pensent à des choses comme ça, mais, mais ce n'est pas, pas, pas là qu'il y a l'essentiel du problème. Le problème, il est aussi entre nous, citoyens. C'est quand euh, un citoyen euh, accède ou peut accéder à la vie privée euh, de l'autre. C'est ça aussi qu'il faut prendre en compte et c'est pour ça qu'on parle de maturité de la société par rapport à ces choses-là et que l'on pense que l'Orient à la CNDP, et donc c'est pour ça que nous avons émis des, des réserves. Les réserves, ben, ça veut dire ce que ça veut dire, ça veut dire qu'on n'est pas convaincu que l'on souhaite échanger et que dans cet échange, peut-être qu'émergeront des éléments importants. Mais j'ai bien noté euh, les, 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 les choses évoquées par Jonathan euh, par rapport aux différentes orientations de, de protection. 
euh, en particulier euh, la tokenisation, en particulier euh, le fait qu'il euh, faut euh, protéger euh, la chose unique pour qu'elle ne se, dé ne se dé déploie pas chez tout le monde et soit accessible euh, auprès de tout le monde. Et donc, on dit bien que d'un point de vue technique, il est nécessaire d'avoir un identifiant unique pour interconnecter, mais on dit qu'il n'est pas nécessaire que cet identifiant soit public. Ça peut être un outil d'interconnexion, sachant que l'interconnexion est sous le couvert d'une loi ou sous le couvert d'une procédure judiciaire. Ok. Um, ok, merci Omar. On va, on va continuer le débat, les discussions. Um, je, I will continue now by asking the perspective of Nigeria. We understood Morocco, there are some reserves from the Data Protection Authority. Um, however, you believe there is potential for resolving the issues by adopting some uh, tokenization uh, technologies that, as explained by World Bank, Jonathan. Uh, so uh, let's uh, move on and ask the perspective from Adija. Adija, if we can take no more than four minutes so we can give the, the debate some dynamic. I'm, I'm uh, thank you very much. Um, good day, everyone. Um, in Nigeria, what we have done was um, to get the policy directive first. Uh, as you all know, we have gone through uh, identity system before which was uh, data collected and cards issued. So the policy directive uh, this time around was to, um, to have an identity management system. An identity management system that uh, was built on uh, privacy from, in, from the initial stage. So it's uh, a system uh, privacy design system. So what we do is uh, from the point of data collection to storage, transmission, and then to access to that database, um, the issue of privacy was considered from the equipment, that's the whole technology, the network infrastructure, and um, even with respect to the human resources, because each and every uh, uh, staff or consultant working within the commission has to go through some security screening and things like that. So that's uh, what it is. Uh, the national identity management, the mandate um, given to the national identity uh, was established uh, under the act of uh, 2007. So there was a parliamentary uh, legislation in place before the DMC started. And the mandate uh, given to the commission is to create, manage, operate uh, the national identity database. And um, the system, the whole system from the, what we call the front end and the back end, middleware and the network infrastructure are all part of um, what the NIMC needs to create, protect and regulate. So where we are now is we have uh, built the infrastructure, uh, both front end and back end. The front end, which consists of the enrollment system may not have been adequate as we are, but uh, when we're going into the ecosystem, the partnership we are having with the World Bank is to make sure that that section of um, the project, the infrastructure, is the data population is enhanced and uh, we have uh, wider coverage across um, the federation. And then um, the back end also, we have a robust back end system. We have uh, the primary database and then a secondary database, which is uh, about more than 200 kilometers away from the primary database. And uh, the middleware, because the way the, the, the infrastructure was, um, was done is uh, not to have a single vendor controlling the whole back end. So we have a fragmented system whereby we have, we have a middleware that interconnect the different um, part of the back end. So the database, the secondary database, and then the PKI infrastructure, and also the, the pilot card uh, personalization bureau are all part of the back end. Then the network infrastructure to ensure security, we made sure that um, the metropolitan area network we have in Abuja that connects to 14 government agencies, all the, these 14 agencies are part of the, the ecosystem that collects data for their respective functional 
requirement. So they are connected to the uh, national identity database to do the fiber optic network. And then um, our state offices in 37 states, including Abuja also are connected by uh, true fiber. And then the larger enrollment centers uh, in over 900 locations are connected um, by VSAT or internet dongles from the network operators. So the system is, um, we, have, um, we have taken the pains from the initial stage of um, the design of the national identity management system to incorporate issues of uh, privacy and security. But as a nation, and we know there's a challenge of um, uh, data protection, uh, national data protection law in the country, but uh, that with the, by the end of uh, this 2020, there's a, the work is already in progress in earnest to make sure that uh, data protection law right. is in place by the end of the year. Okay, Adija, I'm sorry to cut you, but I want to keep the dialogue going. I, I want to ask you a question. Um, you, you have said that there will be um, a unique ID number, NIN. Will that NIN yeah. be used across all government services? So it's a unique number, not sectoral number. No, it's, um, it, the, we have a unique number. However, the different sectors, the different other agencies that, uh, issue, that uh, collect data issue their own sectorial IDs. Like for the bank, they have what they call the bank verification numbers. There's a driver's license. There's a passport for the immigration, passport number for the immigration. But the most important thing is the government policy is that all those other government databases that capture data and issue their sectorial or uh, functional IDs must be linked to the unique national identification number. But there is no requirement that the union be publicly used in service delivery. You give it, it stays in the behind. A back end, and then you can use the sectoral number. Uh, for example, the BVN. Do you see the BVN in, in Nigeria dying, or do you see it continuing to be used? No, it may continue to be used by the banks. Right. The way the way we do it now, because uh, most of these agencies have access to the national ID database, or the harmonization we have done with the uh, with the BVN, we harmonize the, the BVN data with the national ID and we give them back the national identification number. But the, we, have, we have had a rethink of that, looking at the larger security issues and like General, uh, Jonathan stated in his presentation, uh, tokenization and um, hashing is another model that, that we are using for subsequent harmonization that uh, we are going to embark on and even for access to the national identity database. Because right now the verification access from both public and private sector agencies, they are able to see the name. But uh, going forward, which uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, reached an advanced stage in the, our development and our product. So going forward by August, at where we want to launch it by the next um, uh, September 16, uh, to launch that product to make sure that um, going forward, uh, the, the, the right to present an ID will, will be in the hands of the identity holder to, okay. through tokenization. You have a token, you give a token, and that token can only be utilized or utilized by its one single service provider that you presented it to. And it will have a lifespan, uh, a lifespan of 30 days or more, depending okay. on the threshold we want to send for, uh, set for it. Okay. Um, that's, that's actually great news because what you're talking about, not as the old concept of 10 years ago where you had a centralized database with everybody in single number, everybody is in, issued a unique number, and then it's linked, um, services are linked. So we're talking about the future of unique ID, which seems to be um, a form of tokenization or allowing control in the hands of the owners of the identity working with the sectors yeah. themselves. So Hadija, you're giving us wonderful news. So you, you've heard it here first. So let's continue um, with our discussion moving forward. Um, I think um, before I do that, I wanna, I wanna take, take a point and answer a question. Somebody asked anonymously that uh, in our previous session, they said, you wanna move the objective of identity for all from 2030, 
I think it's, ba it's Robert Palacio who said that, that to 2022. And today we've heard um, from Jonathan, we've heard from many others who said the legal framework is very, very important. And, and do we think we're going to be ready to have legal frameworks in place um, by 2022? Um, so that we can actually achieve this objective, or this was just a moment of enthusiasm that is not 100% realistic. Maybe I can I can uh, I can ask one of the panelists if you have any any comment on that. I mean, are you ready? Are you ready with the legal frameworks to allow to the acceleration of 16.9 by eight years? Uh, I I believe Nigeria is very ready. Um, we already have the, the legal framework for the identity sector. We have had policy decisions on the ecosystem. We have a, a cyber crime uh, uh, prohibited and prevention act in place, which is undergoing a second review. And uh, the data protection bill should be up and running by the end of 2020. So for Nigeria, I think we have prepared ourselves because our ecosystem will not move forward if we don't have those uh, legal instruments in place. Okay, so for all the other panelists, when it is your turn, uh, please address that issue, uh, whether you think your country will be ready. I wanna continue, actually, uh, since um, Drudisha Madhub has joined us earlier than expected, uh, Drudisha, are you ready to give your prepared remarks? Uh, please un un unmute yourself. I oh, know she's not there, S sorry. Uh, unmute yourself, please. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. I'm here. Okay. So the question is, we would like to hear the perspective of um, Mauritius about where do you stand on the unique mm -hmm. number? Do you believe it should be a one universal number? Do you think it should be multiple numbers linked? Do you think you want to do tokenization? So give us a perspective from, from Lil Maurice. Okay, thank you so much, Joseph. Yes, I guess uh, all the issues about what is the importance of having a unique ID number has already been put on table. What I'm going to focus on is actually Mauritius has been ready since 2013 with a unique, um, I must say the unique ID number was here since a very long time ago, but the way uh, the new smart ID card has been introduced it's only in 2013 that actually we had a new smart ID card, but the concept of unique identifier has existed a very, very long time ago in Mauritius with the enactment of the national identity card. I'm talking about, let's say 50 years ago. So that concept was already in place in Mauritius, but we came forward with a digital um, unique identifier since 2013 and the um, novelty in, in that a new identity card is that once a person is issued with its uh, national uh, unique um, ID card, actually all the information that is stored on that ID card, for example, his fingerprint or any of the biometric information that the card or the chip may contain actually belongs to the owner only, that is only the individual has the possession of that information, which is on the chip of the card. And no other uh, body has this access to this type of information, except that the national identity card, sorry, agency, once it is issuing the card, it will store the fingerprint data for a minimum period of one day up to a maximum period of seven days. After that, it will be erased automatically and the government agency won't have access to this information because it's no longer in the national ID database. This was in consequence to a Privy Council judgment after long um, um, uh, battles in court as to why fingerprint data or any other biometric data relating to data protection issues obviously has to be stored on the national identity card. And it was a basic, I mean, a wonderful victory for the data protection um, uh, um, perspective because we actually erased um, that fingerprint data from the chip. Um, uh, 
I mean, storing. There is no such issue as storing, but the data is on the COP. Whereas, so tokenization is already in place here. And if I can use another word for, I mean, moving forward with tokenization is actually what we're talking about is anonymization as well in data protection uh, uh, jargon. Anonymization is very important is that the concept of giving a number to uh, an individual, actually you are protecting his personal data from public uh, uh, viewing. Or, and that is a very basic principle in data protection is that we need to anonymize data as far as we can to protect an individual. And tokenization is actually one of the ways of achieving anonymization, which is very much appreciated uh, in, our, in our data protection uh, 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 law. So we already have this legal framework in place and there is no problem actually that we have encountered. Actually, we as the data protection agency in Mauritius had the opportunity of auditing, of uh, checking how the, the information has been deleted if it's truly being deleted, it's not being stored for, or, or you know, to get unauthorized access to, to this type of data. And we were satisfied that things were going in the right direction. So this is one basic point that um, is very important for me to highlight. And in our legal national identity card act, we actually have a provision specifically saying that this um, collection of data should be in compliance with the Data Protection Act of Mauritius. So all the principles that we have in the Data Protection Act are actually being applied to uh, the unique identifier uh, uh, um, way of handling data. So I think from that uh, perspective, uh, we should be quite happy on, on our side that we uh, are actually um, implementing data protection um, from a very um, efficient, uh, in an efficient way. And as I must say that uh, privacy by design has been incorporated in that chip so that the information is actually very secure and there is no way that someone can access this without the consent of the individual. So I would okay. stop here if that answers the question that yes. um, you, you put to me. Yes, yes. thank you. That that answers the question very well. If I were to summarize what you said, um, I mean, Mauritius has a unique ID number, but you are not concerned as the commissioner of the Data Protection Authority because you've implemented strong data protection measures that go along with that unique ID number. It's not a unique ID number in the wild. You are able to delete data. You're able to restrict access to data, and that's why in your case, tokenization is not necessary. Um, I, I don't mean that tokenization is not necessary, but we have gone much forward with, with uh, I mean, the, the very fact that we have a unique ID number, which does not uh, uh, depict the personal information of the person is actually, we're going much further than tokenization is required. This is what I meant to say. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, somebody's asking a, a question specifically to you. I'm not sure I can understand it, but let me read it. How do you prevent fraudulent cards which replicates the format of a true identity card containing biometrics? I assume the cards are issued under cryptography keys, no? Exactly. Uh, uh, the problem here is that being given that the ownership of the card is that of the individual. That is, it's his card, it's his identity, it's his number. So if there's any kind of, of, of illegal activity that is being done. Obviously, there is a legal framework for that. We have what we call the Computer Misuse and Cybercrime Act in accordance with the Budapest uh, Council of Europe Convention, which follows all the principles uh, uh, to protect the information and the cyber, uh, cyber security risks that may stem from, from any fraudulent activity being done with the card. So we have this legal framework. And then we have other institutions in Mauritius, what we call the CERT, which yes. actually uh, handle uh, a computer incidents. And we have a cybercrime police unit, which also handles cybercrime offenses being committed. So these are the, the agencies which look after any type of fraudulent activity being done with any card, uh, any misuse of any card. And we have a very, 
I, I must say we have many cases in Mauritius which have been reported and successfully completed by um, the uh, police cybercrime, the CERT, and the Data Protection Office to some extent because we also handle personal information. We have had um, cases as well relating to personal um, data being uh, fraudulently used that were reported to the Data Protection Office. I must say also we handle these inquiries quite well and the outcome has been successful. And because also any type of infringement of the Data Protection Act is an offense. It's a criminal offense under our law. So we prosecute people e even under the Data Protection Act. We don't really need always to go under computer misuse or any other electronic transactions act, for example. We can also use the Data Protection Act. And this is like the panoply of leg uh, legal legislations. I must say legislations that we have which go in the same direction, that is criminal sanctioning. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. You've got legal frameworks, you've got criminal institutions that look after the abuse, and then you also have technical measures in place, so a unique ID number can live without any concerns to the data protection authorities. Bravo. Um, um, thank you. Je vais poser la même question à Monsieur Massamba de Gabon. Um, cher Monsieur, est-ce que vous pouvez répondre à cette Question. Unmute, s'il vous plaît. OK. Allô? Oh. Allô. Oui, docteur. Oh. Oui. Bonjour. Bonjour. Bienvenue. Merci. C'est un plaisir de vous retrouver. Alors, les perspectives de votre pays sur la question des identifiants uniques. Ah. Merci, docteur. Le Gabon, à l'instar des autres pays d'Afrique hein, francophone, euh, nous avons fait le choix, donc, euh, depuis 2012, euh, de mettre en place euh, une identité unique afin d'éliminer les doublons d'identité euh, qui existaient déjà dans les registres électoraux. Euh, c'était donc une première bataille qui a consisté donc d'abord à nettoyer le fichier électoral parce que ce fichier était à l'origine de plusieurs, euh, plusieurs récriminations chaque fois qu'il y avait les élections. Mais on n'en est pas resté là. Euh, L'objectif était donc de centraliser une identité dans un système unique servant à la fois à un registre d'état civil et à un registre d'identification de toute la population. Et pourquoi pas plus tard l'utiliser comme un registre sûr pour pouvoir diffuser cette identité unique rattachée aux données biométriques vers d'autres systèmes de l'État ou du privé. Dans le futur, donc, grâce à la reconnaissance légale de l'identité unique qu'on a donc générée à travers ce registre de population, nous avons introduit deux projets de loi au niveau du Parlement. Et ces projets de loi sont en cours de discussion. Euh, malheureusement, il y a quelques semaines, le Parlement est parti en vacances. Donc, euh, ces deux projets de loi seront donc revus en septembre. Donc, grâce à ces deux projets de loi, surtout le, le projet de loi sur le numéro d'identifiant personnel, nous allons donc pouvoir mettre en place euh, des services supplémentaires. Euh, ces sur services supplémentaires vont pouvoir mettre en place une plateforme qui va pouvoir déployer cet identifiant unique aux autres administrations. Et pour gérer donc ces, ces différentes connexions avec des parties tierces, nous avons donc sollicité récemment auprès de la BAD et de la Banque mondiale une, une étude de faisabilité donc, qui est en cours. Concernant la protection des données, comme vous l'avez, comme je l'ai si bien entendu, euh, le Gabon également, depuis 2011, avant d'introduire la biométrie dans le processus électoral de l'État civil, euh, le Gabon avait donc fait prendre une loi euh, 
qui permet de mettre en place un organe qui est le gendarme des données, qui s'appelle la Commission nationale de protection des données à caractère personnel. Donc, euh, cet organe existe depuis 2011. Et elle est là pour donc réguler euh, les, les, les données des, des usagers. Euh, ensuite, j'ai entendu le terme de la tokenisation. Comme vous le savez, bon, nous, on était partis euh, également sur la base de l'existence de plusieurs bases de données dans l'administration que dans le privé qui utilisent les applications métiers. Et chaque base de données a ses propres euh, identifiants. Donc, euh, nous, on pense que c'était une aubaine déjà pour que ces administrations puissent protéger en arrière-plan euh, les données des citoyens en leur octroyant des données propres à chaque système. Cependant, euh, dans le but de pouvoir lutter contre la fraude, Hein, les, les usurpations d'identité. Donc, euh, nous voulons donc nous appuyer sur l'identité unique pour pouvoir relier donc toutes, les, les, toutes les, les bases de données. Et pour cela, nous avons donc besoin de pouvoir déployer le plus tôt possible euh, un identifiant, donc cet identifiant unique, à travers un titre. Euh, ces titres, c'est pour les nationaux, c'est la carte nationale d'identité. Pour les résidents étrangers qui sont sur le territoire, c'est euh, la carte de séjour. Donc, euh, ces deux documents, ces deux titres, devraient normalement avoir ce numéro euh, unique pour pouvoir euh, consolider l'identité face, face aux fraudes. OK. OK. Alors, il y a un numéro identique unique qui est attribué à, à, quand la personne reçoit leur carte nationale d'identité. Ce n'est pas attribué à la naissance. Est-ce que, est que j'ai bien compris? Non. Nous avons, le système qui a été mis, comme je vous ai dit, nous sommes partis d'abord sur la base d'un registre euh, de population, mais un, un type de population, ce sont les électeurs, donc les citoyens âgés de 18 ans et plus. Donc, ceux-là qui sont rentrés dans ce registre à travers les élections ont pu avoir donc un numéro d'identifiant personnel. Donc, nous allons entamer des nouvelles campagnes d'enrôlement qui vont pouvoir permettre de générer des numéros d'identifiants personnels à une catégorie de citoyens âgés de 16 ans et plus. Ok. Je vous rappelle aussi, euh, le vote dans notre pays n'est pas obligatoire. Donc, toutes les populations âgées de 18 ans et plus ne se sont pas enrôlées. Donc, mmh. là, nous comptons euh, mettre en place un système pour pouvoir générer des cartes nationales d'identité en enrôlant les citoyens âgés de 16 ans et plus. Cependant, pour les populations jeunes, donc nous avons dans le cas du projet de l'État civil à la reprise de l'existant du fichier des actes de naissance. Donc à partir de là, sur la base d'un fichier centralisé, nous allons donc reconstituer les actes en leur attribuant un numéro unique. Okay. Pour les populations qui sont entre 0 et 16 ans. OK. OK, merci beaucoup. Euh, on n'a pas beaucoup de temps, alors j'aimerais bien avoir un débat, une discussion. Alors, um, I will ask uh, to continue with, with Ruben, if we can be brief with four uh, minutes. You have a big project, it's the Huduma number. Alors, uh, So, what is this about? How it's being attributed, and where do you stand with the legal framework to protect from the data protection issues that you uh, have heard from the other uh, panelists? So, Ruben, if you unmute your uh, microphone, please, and join join us with a statement. Ruben, are you connected? Um, I think Ruben is having a technical problem. Um, Ruben, if you can hear us and you're having a technical problem, we will uh, try, we'll try. Can, can you unmute yourself, please? Unmute.
Okay, maybe maybe I'll come back. Uh, Ruben, you are there. Okay. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Please. Okay. The maybe this perspective of a unique identifier in Africa. I would like to give a little bit of a background in the Kenyan context in terms of uh, having a unique identifying number and also using uh, the identity card as a record of a unique identifier. First of all, in Kenya, <clears throat> uh, at the age of 18, everybody is issued with an identity card, which is unique. And it's unique because it's tied to his biometrics, to the fingerprints. That number which you uh, issued at the age of 18 is the number which is now used by all other organizations for purpose of issuance of other services. If uh, one is uh, trying to apply for a driving license, first of all, you'd have to authenticate the identity card number, not the ID, the identity card number in the database so that you are sure that the person whom you are issuing with the driving license is the same person who is holding that ID and the same cut a close or other services. If it's uh, with our tax system, our health system, our social security system, you require your identity card number, which is tied to your biometrics. And of course, now the ID. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, how effective it has been, I would go maybe to all aspects of the Kenyan uh, fabric. If it's an uh, electoral system, you cannot register as a voter if you have not been issued an ID. And it is the ID which is used by the electoral commission for purpose of registering an individual as an elector. Actually by our law, it, uh, you cannot vote when you don't have an ID. Uh, and all other aspects, whether it's in social banks, you cannot open a bank account if you don't have an ID. And the banks cross-reference with the database for purpose of indicating that the person who is opening the account or person who is carrying out the transaction is the person, the real person, the holder. So for this uh, discussion, maybe it's, look, it's important to look at it uh, in the two segments that first of all, the identity card must be tied to the biometrics or any other reference. Again, the identity, the, the identity of the person who is issued with this unique ident identity uh, would have to now get an ID to authenticate the particulars of that uh, individual. Uh, Kenya, 95% of the population have an ID unique to them because you reference them on the biometrics. The biometrics are held at, uh, at the National Registration uh, Bureau database. As of now, we don't have uh, an electronic ID. That's what, where we are trying to develop one right now, but we don't have one. But even in terms of the, the kind and kind, which is, in, uh, no, is not uh, electronic, you have a, a, a fingerprint. And we have fingerprint officers all over the country the police, they are trained for purpose of identification of, a, of the, some, yeah, some of the policemen are trained so that in case somebody presents an ID and you wanted to be sure that it is the case, the person you have, either you'd have to make use of the National Education Bureau or those trained policemen who know about the, the, the fingerprints. So you tie the identity of this person to his biometrics. And as I said, 95% uh, of the people above 18 have a unique identifier. Mm -hmm. Our vacuum has been those below 18, that is uh, those who are minority, age of minority, because you find that those are issued with birth certificates. But even for that, let me make a clarification, even for those below 18, you cannot be issued with a birth certificate if the identity card of your parents is not indicated in, the, in right. your system. So in terms of authentication that the child you are issuing a birth certificate with is the child of a Kenyan, you'd have to rely on the unique identity card number of the parents. So right. uh, that, 
that has been our missing, missing uh, segment in terms of uh, having a unique identifier for the whole population. And uh, that's why we have embarked on this uh, national integrated system, which uh, a lot of you have heard called the Huduma, where mm -hmm. we want to start issuing a unique identifier at birth. A child is born, is issued with a, a unique identification number. By the time that child is going to school, primary school, our plan is to start capturing the fingerprints so right. that fingerprints would go to the database. At the age of 18, it is only for that child to apply for a, an ID and to issue it on the spot without necessarily subjecting that individual to further scrutiny. Ruben, In sorry to cut you off. Uh, we're running out of time. So I, I resume. You are on the pathway to issue unique identifiers to the entire population. The adults already have it. The children are getting derived from their parents, but you will be issuing them at birth uh, an identifier and that will follow them throughout life. So sorry about, about that because we're running out of time and I need, I need to hear from Sufyan before we can um, continue um, with the community voices. We'll, we'll bring you back in, Blood Ruben. Sorry about that. Thank you for that. Sofian. Bonjour, Monsieur. Uh, merci, Monsieur Atik. Uh, en fait, en Tunis, uh, en tu je vais un peu vous présenter l'expérience uh, en Tunisie. Donc, en Tunisie, donc, nous avons une particularité qu'il y a moins quatre, cinq secteurs qui ont une informatique qui date depuis le début des années 70 avec des, des systèmes d'information déjà existants, qu'ils ont déjà des systèmes, d des, des identifiants sectoriels bel et bien existants. Je cite en particulier le, le secteur social, le, le ministère des Finances et la gestion de, de l'État civil. Nous avons un, un système informatisé d'État civil euh, qui a été mis en place en, depuis les années 80. Cette diversité d'identifiants secte unique, entre guillemets, et d'identifiants sectoriels, euh, ça... Ça nous a compliqué un peu la, la tâche d'échange de, de données en Tunisie. Ralenti, ralenti, Sofiane, l'interprète. D'accord. Donc, je disais, je disais, donc, cette multitude d'identifiants sectoriels donc, euh, a rendu très difficile euh, les échanges de données intersecteurs et euh, nous a ça a rendu très coûteux, en fait, les, les, les rapprochements entre les différentes bases de données. Ce qui a, a été en fait le cause de ralentissement pour la mise en place de la base de données sociale depuis des, depuis des années. Donc l'idée c'était un besoin de mettre en place un identifiant unique citoyen qui ne dépend pas d'un secteur particulier et qui est transversal et transverse fédérateur pour tous les autres secteurs. La conjoncture de la COVID en Tunisie, donc ça a, ça a accéléré un peu les choses surtout avec des besoins euh, urgents de distribution et d'assistance euh, gouvernementale pour, pour la population. Donc, on a eu un, au, mois, au mois de mai un nouveau cadre euh, légal, une nouvelle loi avec les décrets d'application pour l'instauration d'un identifiant unique citoyen attribué dès la naissance et qui est rattaché à l'État civil. Donc, le, le décret loi a été, est paru euh, dans le journal officiel en Tunisie en date de 12, de 12 mai, le décret d'application trois jours après, en, donc, euh, quand, euh, le, 15, le 15 mai dernier. Donc, à quoi consiste cet identifiant, ce, ce nouveau identifiant Donc, c'est un numéro euh, sans signification particulière donc, euh, dans sa structure, qui est composé de 11, de 11 caractères, comme je disais, il est attribué à la naissance et maintenu euh, durant tous les cycles de vie et tous les événements de la vie, et maintenu jusqu'à 30 ans après le décès ou euh, 30 ans après la perte de la nationalité. Donc, ce numéro est attribué pour chaque citoyen tunisien euh, enregistré dans l'état civil ou euh, a eu la nationalité tunisienne. Euh, donc, mais euh, on a été confronté à une situation. Comment faire avec les identifiants sectoriels Est-ce qu'on s'oriente vers l'interdiction ou le remplacement de tous les identifiants sectoriels par ce nouveau numéro euh, unique ou pas, etc. Donc, on a vu que ça sera très coûteux 
de toucher à tous les systèmes d'information et toucher à tous les systèmes existants qui sont fonctionnels et de remplacer par cet, cet, cet identifiant. Donc, on s'est orienté vers une architecture d'identifiant euh, unique, mais euh, progressivement, donc à terme, euh, va être, tout va être remplacé par, par un seul identifiant euh, unique. Donc, on, on a mis en place donc, un système de table de correspondance euh, entre les, ce nouveau identifiant unique citoyen et les quatre identifiants sectoriels, grands, euh, sectoriels pour les grands euh, systèmes d'information sectoriels, à savoir l'affaire sociale, donc tout ce qui est social, l'identifiant unique élève pour tout ce qui est le, pour, pour l'enseignement, et un identifiant, ce n'est pas un vrai identifiant, mais c'est le numéro de carte d'identité, donc, euh, euh, donc euh, et le matricule, matricule, fi, matricule fiscal pour les sociétés à, à caractère personnel, donc pour les euh, détenus par, par, 10 personnes, par 10 personnes physiques. Donc, on a mis cette table de correspondance qui assure en fait le mapping entre les différentes euh, identifiants sectoriels avec une plateforme d'interopérabilité assurant les échanges inter, euh, intersecteurs. Ce qui nous a permis, euh, durant la période de, de la COVID, d'assurer, de, de mettre en place un nombre de services électroniques urgents pour la société, qui est pour, dans, imposé par la conjoncture de la COVID, et surtout, surtout, de terminer cette fameuse base de données sociale à travers le rapprochement de 14 base de données sectorielle. Donc, on a eu aujourd'hui euh, une base de données de plus de 2 millions de, de bénéficiaires euh, de différents types pour le euh, social. Donc, euh, 2 millions sur le 11, sur le 11 millions de, 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 de Tunisiens. Donc, euh, de notre euh, de Tunisien. Et aussi, nous a permis aussi de mettre en place certains euh, services électroniques euh, urgence, notamment l'inscription euh, scolaire, euh, aussi une, 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 une et déclaration d'impôts et, et paiement d'impôts aussi pour la, pour la population qui n'était pas possible de le faire physiquement à travers les, les, can, les canaux classiques. Donc le nouveau cadre euh, pour l'identifiant unique citoyen, donc, euh, donc il met un rôle de contrôle de bout en bout pour l'instance nationale de protection de données caractère personnel et, euh, et aussi il donne le droit aux citoyens, c'est mis dans la loi, dans le droit aux citoyens de euh, être informé de toutes les informations euh, de son identifiant et aussi toutes les utilisations euh, sur son identifiant et à travers son identifiant, nous sommes en train de travailler euh, de, sur une plateforme destinée pour les citoyens, lui permettant d'accéder à tous les événements qui sont euh, faits à travers son identifiant ou en utilisant son identifiant. Ok, c'est bien. Merci beaucoup. En fait, uh, I, I want to summarize a little bit what you said, but in English, because I'm not sure the, the interpreters were able to catch you. Um, Tunis, um, Tunisia has put in place a very pragmatic approach towards the question of the unique identifier. And their pragmatic approach was not to simply ignore the, the, um, the sectorial uh, numbers. The, each sector has their own number. Uh, they think um, uh, there could be, in the long term, a unique number that could be attributed. Uh, but in the meantime, there is a table of correspondence, uh, which includes uh, the social identity number, the national identity number, scholarization number, tax ID number, which basically refer um, these numbers to a unique ID number, which could be attributed. Um, you've implemented mechanisms and measures that allow um, the owner of this number to know if somebody accessed their data, I assume this is uh, from, a, from a, an accessible website or, or something uh, that is on a mobile application so that they are notified when there is a use of their number and they could inquire about that. Um, this is a very recent development. This came out in May. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, clearly we're hearing a, 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 an approach that is complementary to the other approaches that we've heard about. Um, I'm going to come back to the panel with some, some other thoughts, which I'll ask them to, to prepare. But in the meantime, uh, sort of think about what closing messages and, and um, sort of take home. You want one message to give the, the, the attendees with. But in the meantime, I want to hear from the community. And please, the community, there's been six or seven that have raised their hands. I want to recognize um, a few, uh, but please do not take 
more than two minutes, I will be obligated to cut you off at two minutes. Okay, so please, the first one uh, that I want to bring on, it's going to be uh, Pam Dixon. Um, could you please uh, promote Pam to the panel? <clears throat> Operators, could you please promote Pam to the panel? Welcome, Pam. Hi, am I here yet? Oh, I am here. Yes. So thank you, um, Joseph, and thank you for a wonderful panel to all of the panelists. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Your, your panel's been excellent. So I just wanted to add on to some of the items that have been said in regards to um, identity and privacy. I wanted to talk just briefly about a different aspect of identity, which is sustainability. This isn't often discussed in the context of IDs, whether they be federated or et cetera. But really we now have a very large body of work which indicates that in order for ID systems to have genuine sustainability, they will have certain characteristics. One of these is legislative sustainability. So for example, we have 143 jurisdictions now in the world that have passed GDPR legislation or GDPR-like legislation that is interoperable. And I think that going forward, that identity systems will need to find interoperability at this level, which will bring it more to um, Commissioner Madhub's level where you have a very strong um, protection system for the identity um, number or system. And then I wanted to also discuss very briefly the idea of technological sustainability. So we talk a lot about SDG 9, but there are other targets, um, 9.1, 9.4, 9.5, um, to really upgrade technological capacity. And really the upgraded technological capacity today based on our scientific and technological evidence is to have much more of a federated system or tokenization, or as Commissioner Madhub said, go beyond tokenization. So the, while the centralized numbers are easier at the beginning, there's a very, very high cost in terms of sustainability analysis over the long run. So I do think that's an important consideration in an analysis of a system. And then finally, I wanted to talk about social sustainability which is the role of trust in identity systems. I think we all know and have seen in history that in order to have sustainable systems of data, we have to have both governments that trust the data in terms of accuracy, but we also have to have people and data protection authorities that trust the system to be transparent and accountable. So in, okay. in doing a system analysis, we've got to consider all of these things. Thank you okay. so much, Joseph. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Okay, um, I will I will do um, back to the panel now, and then I will bring back uh, another person from from the audience. But I'll go back to the panel, and I will ask basically uh, starting with Hadija, I will ask what one thing from your experience would you recommend the attendee to pay attention to when building. Um, a unique ID number of the population. Just one thing. I'm, I'm sure there are many, but one important thing. Adija, unmute, please. Yes, um, uh, the one thing um, I think uh, every government should take into consideration is getting the legal regulatory framework right. Okay. Yes, uh, once, you, once you get the legal regulatory framework right, then uh, it will take care of the technology, the, the, the human aspect of it and things like that. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Omar, une seule chose, qu'est-ce que vous voulez les, les, les participants entendre de vous? C'est quoi? Omar? Non. Vous m'entendez? Oui. Pour, pour moi, en fait, le, le problème n'est pas n'est pas vraiment le problème d'identifiant unique. Pour moi, le, le problème est euh, quel est le cadre d'interconnexion qu'on souhaite avoir. Ce cadre d'interconnexion doit-il être ouvert par défaut à toutes les bases de données sans 
grand contrôle ou doit-il être réglementé petit à petit et de façon sérieuse et contrôlable L'identifiant unique, c'est un moyen, encore une fois, technique. Mais est-ce que on va le rendre disponible à tout un chacun et chacun, selon sa capacité à croiser les données, pourra les croiser plus facilement. Pour moi, c'est ça, ça le, le, le sujet. Donc, le fait de parler d'identifiant unique sans parler du cadre d'interconnexion, euh, pour moi, on n'avance pas beaucoup dans, dans, la, dans, la, dans le sujet. Quand, euh, dans des pays comme euh, l'Estonie ou la Tunisie, euh, on prend un dispositif euh, qui permet d'informer le, le, le citoyen ou que le citoyen soit informé dès lors que ces données sont utilisées, c'est un bon cadre, c'est une bonne chose. Mais est-ce que c'est suffisant C'est là où il faut faire une analyse de risque et que ça dépend euh, du contexte euh, socio-économique, à mon sens. OK. Um, just to tell the audience, Um, the audience, uh, we will be bringing back the subject in more technical detail and in more regulatory detail by focusing on one country at a time within the, within the framework of the, um, the CPR, which is the Country Progress Reports. I promise you, we will address the subject. There's a lot of interest. Um, I want to continue with uh, Madhu. Please uh, give us um, your perspective. Yes, thank you, Joseph. I, I believe there should be only one and only a prime consideration to the human right to identity, and that is the protection of the individual's interests. This is my only uh, way to summarize what we are aiming at is protecting the individual, and uh, that is what we should all have in mind, including um, from an international, regional, or local perspective. Is this a form of do no harm kind of principle that you subscribe to? Absolutely. Do no harm is just one component of what I'm talking about. I, I, as I believe, we should be always proactive and prepared to, to really innovate. I believe in every sense of the word, innovation is linked to this uh, unique ID card. The way we, we actually want to do it in any context is linked to the level of innovation that the country has the level of infrastructure that the country has, but with whatever infrastructure the country has, basically we can always protect individuals in our own ways. So this is what I believe we should, we should aim, and that should be the only aim behind having, whether it's sectorial, a unique ID number, or even as many tokenization or numbers as you wish, but the only consideration should be it is a human right and we should protect the individual. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, operator, please promote Anita just to join the community. And Anita, please, two minutes, I'll cut you off. Um, uh, please, Anita from the World Bank, join, join the discussion and then I'll come back to the panel. Thank you, Joseph and Heidi for Africa for giving me this opportunity. So the minute I think of protecting UIN, I'm reminded of an image in India when I visited a school. They had a very strong iron door. And what do you see? There are no boundary walls. So the minute you protect the UIN by tokenization, you're protecting the UIN. But if the security of the system is not in place, we could use the other identity attribute or a mobile number to do data correlation or surveillance. On the same note, we know that countries in the EU have built strong walls and doors and used the single identification number to provide services proactively to the users by using joined up services. However, I feel yes, tokenization may answer the problem of making it difficult to link data. But I would probably like to raise two open questions which are raised because of tokenization. So as Jonathan said, there are two main purposes or functions of ID system. One is continuous authentication. So in the context of Africa, if there is no internet connectivity, 
and a person comes with their virtual ID or the ID number to identify, how will you link that person's data with the backend token? With the tokenization in place, it's not possible to link with the token. Second problem is the act of linking data across databases. So India has implemented tokenization, but we still don't have a solution which enables sharing of data with tokenization in the context of India. They have used, they have allowed trusted authorized entities to store the ID number. So I think a good design and implementation of a tokenization system which allows linking of data is the need of the hour. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, absolutely, we need to be sensitive to the context of Africa. Tokenization might be a complex process. It needs infrastructure. If that does not exist, we have to be looking at other alternatives to protect um, the interests of the owners of that data, um, and, but always, always within the context of Africa. Um, I want to continue. Uh, Ruben, give us a closing thought um, on, on the subject. What do you want people to remember from what you said? <clears throat> Unmute, please. Ruben? I'm trying. Okay, we lost Ruben. So let's continue with uh, Mr. Masamba. Aimee Masamba, uh, s'il vous plaît, est-ce que vous, vous pouvez résumer rapidement uh, un message pour, pour la, les participants? Ruben, we'll come to you. Aimee? Docteur, uh, reprenez la question, s'il vous plaît. Je n'ai pas bien suivi. Hein. Je vais le Est-ce qu'il y a un message que vous voulez laisser les participants entendre sur la question de l'identifiant unique? Est-ce qu'il y a une recommandation que vous voulez donner? Vous voulez faire? Unmute, s'il vous plaît. OK. Euh, merci, docteur. Je pense que... La problématique de l'identifiant unique, euh, elle est réelle pour euh, tous les systèmes d'information face à la fraude d'identité. Donc, si on veut vraiment réellement protéger le citoyen, il faut d'abord qu'on s'assure que ces données réelles soient stockées quelque part et que, également, l'usage de ces données contre ces personnes aussi soit protégé à l'égard des tiers. Donc, euh, nous pensons que Euh, la tokenisation est un fait. J'ai entendu euh, Madame euh, tout à l'heure parler de Madame euh, Madou, je crois, sur la problématique de la connectivité en Afrique pour la tokenisation. Je pense que euh, permettre l'usage d'identifiants des, des, sectoriels est une bonne chose parce que ça permet à chaque entité de pouvoir utiliser son référentiel, mais d'avoir derrière la plateforme qui va pouvoir échanger dans un système ouvert pour que ces données-là puissent être consultées vraiment avec la, la plus faible connectivité existante. OK. Et en pragmatisme. OK. On continue. Ruben, can you please step back in? Uh, you have your uh, microphone on. Ruben? Yes. Okay. Sorry about uh, my system. I think uh, uh, my contribution to this is uh, on uh, three fronts. One of them in terms of the legal framework, our Registration of Persons Act protects data, which is uh, captured by the National Registration Bureau from being issued to another individual without the express uh, authority of that individual. So you cannot access data from our systems unless that individual himself expressly has given authority, except for prosecution and other purposes. In okay. terms of the national integrated management system which we are coming up with, uh, we one of the conditions was for us to come up with a data protection act, 
which was enacted in December. We have a Data Protection Act. But beside that, you find uh, because of uh, privacy issues, a lot of individuals have gone to court asking that uh, a lot of safeguards should be put before we can capture all the data. What we are trying to come up with is to integrate all the data which is held by other agencies into one framework. As of we are now, you find other agencies uh, use data from the National Station Bureau through a system we call the e-government, where for purpose of uh, services, you log in and you're able to process uh, your documentation from one center. But you are trying to come up with a, an, a system whereby you have a database where if it is all the services you have instead of you now going to various agencies, so that before you process services for an individual, you can do it from one spot. So that's what we are trying to come up with with this Huduma number. It has its own challenges. Like I said, we have very good challenges. We also okay. have technological issues to do with it because it's a new phenomenon. As you can see, I said we already have uh, an unique number for people above 18. Below 18, we have also come up with uh, an ambitious program in Kenya to capture all the bus and uh, digitize them. So that the number which will be issued by civil registration at the birth is the number which will become the unique identifier for that individual. Okay. Maybe, maybe just let me point out that uh, outside uh, the use of unique identifier for purpose of uh, persons at a country's uh, segment, the, there is one crucial area, security. Uh, mm -hmm. We find now we have uh, global issues of security all over, maybe let me say over the world, and uh, the unique identity number we have in Kenya is playing a big role in terms of safeguarding us against terrorism and other issues of, uh, of insecurity. Because okay. yeah. So you see, you see the unique ID number playing a role in the national security of the country. Okay, let, let's, I'm sorry, let's move on. Um, Sofian, um, then I'm going to ask uh, Jonathan, and then there will be one more person and then stay tuned because we are going to repeat the poll because I want to see if there's been any change. We know exactly the numbers before. We know, we're going to run it again and see if there's any change in mind or whether you are all on the same uh, point. Sofian, please. Uh, merci. Uh, bri brièvement, je peux, mon message, en fait, uh, uh, je disais, je dirais, uh, les aspects techniques sont maîtrisables. On connaît les solutions sont multiples. Il n'y a pas une bonne solution. Il y a des solutions. Mais le message, peut-être que je j'aime bien le faire passer c'est qu'il faut un consensus de ce, à partir de notre expérience en Tunisie le plus important c'est de trouver un consensus entre les différents acteurs intervenant dans l'identifiant le grand challenge pour nous était comment garantir que tout le monde travaille ensemble avec le même objectif tout le monde, je dis tout le monde tous les acteurs que ce soit les techniciens les cadres techniques cadres métiers et organes de contrôle ça c'est plus important pour nous Les aspects techniques sont importants, le cadre légal très important, mais le plus important dans tous, c'est comment avoir un consensus pour garantir la pérennité de l'identifiant et du système d'identification. Et merci. Parfait. Uh, merci beaucoup. Um, I want to promote uh, one additional person from the Maghreb, uh, Professor Hani from Algeria. So we've had Tunisie, we had Maroc. Uh, can you please uh, promote him to the panel? And um, Professor Henny, est-ce que vous pouvez uh, participer sur le panel, s'il vous plaît? Uh, rapidement, brièvement. And then we'll close with the keynote speaker, Jonathan. Um, is Professor Henny there? Okay. Bienvenue. Bon. Unmute. Oui. Alors bonjour, bonjour tout le monde. Je vous remercie, euh, professeur, pour euh, pour ce panel qui est un panel très important, très intéressant. Bonjour, bonjour tout le monde. Moi, je voudrais juste intervenir pour parler un peu de l'Algérie aussi et de et, et, et bon, en, en Algérie, comme a dit tout à l'heure Sofiane, c'est que nous avons aussi chaque secteur a, a, a sa propre son propre identifiant et comme le fisc, il y a son propre identifiant, la la, la CNAS, l'assurance Le social, ils ont leur propre identifiant, mais on est venu en, en 2014, on est venu en 2014 pour dire 
qu'il faut un, un, un numéro national. Donc nous avons un identifiant national qui est relié, qui est lié à l'État civil. Ça veut dire tout, ça veut dire tout, tout Algérien, tout Algérien inscrit dans l'État civil a son propre identifiant qui est composé. C'est un numéro composé qui est de 18 caractères et qui est composé de, 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 de numéros de l'identité nationale, de, de, de l'État civil, là où il a, le, le, le lieu de naissance, le lieu de naissance, le numéro. Donc il y a, il, il est composé. Il y a un décret qui explique comment il est composé ce numéro. Donc, chaque fois, donc, donc, tout Algérien, donc, tout Algérien a un numéro, premièrement. Deuxièmement, le numéro, il est… Donc, tout, tout ce qui… Les secteurs qui, qui accèdent à, à travers un réseau privé à, à l'État civil, donc, ils peuvent accéder à, au numéro de national. Aussi, pour ce qui est du passeport, donc, ce numéro, on le retrouve dans le passeport, dans la carte d'identité nationale, dans le permis de conduire, on le trouve dans tous les documents officiels vous trouvez ce document et bientôt nous avons un, un décret qui va sortir qui va mettre dans l'acte la, de naissance ce numéro donc ce, donc le citoyen a ce numéro donc ce numéro comme de toi de disait le collègue le collègue au Maroc c'est un problème c'est juste c'est technique c'est technique c'est parce que ce numéro nous permet d'offrir un, un service de qualité aux citoyens c'est surtout pour la pour, pour pour servir pour offrir une qualité aussi, un, un travail aux citoyens et ne, ne, ne pas l'obliger à, à ramener des documents à chaque fois, d'aller de ramener, de, de, de ramener des, des, des documents d'administration. Donc, sur, sur, sur le plan juridique, sur le plan texte, nous avons la loi sur la protection des données euh, personnelles qui, 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 est, euh, qui est en vigueur. Et nous avons aussi une, une loi sur la cybercriminalité qui protège toutes ces, tout, tout ces données et tous ces réseaux. Voilà, professeur. Okay, excellent. Merci beaucoup. Um, now I would like to ask our keynote speaker, Jonathan, to give us a closing wisdom. And then I'd like to run the poll again. So please stay with us because it's very important to see if there's any changes in, in the perspective. Jonathan, please. Thank you very much, Joseph. And uh, greetings from tomorrow to everyone from Australia. It's now uh, the 24th. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. I'd like to thank all the fellow speakers. Um, I've learned a lot and, and the discussion in the chat box as well has been uh, very dynamic. Um, I, I, I presented five key messages in my keynote and, and those I, I believe are still valid. Um, and I agree with everything that um, the fellow panelists said um, in their closing remarks. I particularly want to acknowledge what um, Madhub said about, about putting the interests of uh, the people and protecting their interests um, first or, or do no harm. Um, in terms of a closing thought, uh, um, I, I have three. Um, for three things that, that um, three tools that I hope uh, you can all use because um, it is possible to protect uh, people's identity and to have the benefits of uniqueness and data matching right? It's possible to do those two things. So first of all is threat modeling, right? When you're making your decision, anal uh, identify and analyze the threats. The second is privacy or data protection impact assessments. Third is work with academics and, and civil society in your countries because um, they probably uh, have done a lot of thinking um, and examination of the options. Um, and, and certainly for the World Bank, we really look forward to working with, um, with Nigeria, with Tunisia, with Gabon, with Morocco um, on their journeys and, and uh, many other countries where we work. So please also visit our website um, to have a look at some of our materials. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Operator, run the poll, please, before, uh, before you go and before we close. Could you please run the poll and um, please participate uh, all the... Um, okay, please vote so we can see where the results are. Um, and uh, uh, of course, I'd like to thank this while we're co composing the, the numbers. I'd like to thank the participants, the panelists for a wonderful, uh, wonderful contribution. Um, I think, uh, as always the case, the issues are very, very interesting and rich. So I think they will fuel uh, the kind of discussions that is action oriented that we are going to have to have when we come back in the new season after the, the, the break. Um, so please stay with us. Uh, in the meantime, 
do not, uh, if, if you have missed uh, any of our, our series, our episodes, um, please go to the YouTube uh, channel and subscribe and activate the, 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 the bell. I think it's very important that as a community, we stay together. Um, so uh, please come back in. Okay. Um, so now we go back, uh, I will, I'll wait one more minute. I think I'll, I'll few, uh, we have 58% of the, of the vote and uh, it looks like, uh, I just want to wait till 60% of the vote. So at least if, if there is anybody wanting to vote, we have at 59% uh, voted. Um, okay, let's not, I had 60% now. Uh, please stop the vote and show the results. Okay, so basically uh, what we're hearing is that 71% should uh, believe should be the same number, 29% believe should be sectorial. Um, in fact, I don't know if it's statistically significant, but it, I think it seems to have moved in the direction of believing that it one unique number universal. Um, however, I believe because people heard a lot of, a lot of good practices to attribute or to add to uh, from a data protection uh, that give them perhaps the comfort that a yeah, universal number can work. It's simple, but needs to be accompanied by very, very strong data protection measures. Uh, Tunisia has, has been doing something in that regard. Um, Mauritius has examples also to share in that regard. Um, in Nigeria with the tokenization uh, work that they will be starting to do. So a rich set of experiences that we can uh, look forward to as we move uh, this discussion forward. Again, thank you all very much for your attendance and, and, and please th join me in thanking the panel for their time and energy. And I apologize for the delay um, in the session. Thank you very much. See you in September, September 3rd. And my apologies for, uh, we've had a lot of people that raised their hands. It's just, we didn't have enough time to, uh, to allow everybody to speak and participate. It's a good problem to have, but we will be managing it better. So trust me, come back. We will have chances for you to participate and hear your voices. This time was a, was a first experience for us where we are promoting people to the panel so they can raise issues and, and get off the panel um, impromptu. So thank you so much and have a wonderful summer. See you in September. Thank you. Oh.